turning to Kibaki, the leader, as we have heard from the story of his life and times, as far back as July of 1974, the Honorable Mwai Kibaki was named by Time magazine as one of the 150 men and women who would become new world leaders. Six years later, in 1997, and nine years later, in 1981, the same magazine named him as one amongst 100 people with remarkable leadership qualities. So the world had noticed his leadership promise. But his leadership abilities were not only obvious to the editors of Time magazine and the world at large, they were also noticed by those close to him as well. His professor at Makerere University in the 1950s, Professor Keith Ingram, noted, if Honorable Mwai Kibaki had not joined politics, he was destined to become the first African president of the World Bank. A similar observation was made by the former World Bank president, Mr. Robert McNamara, who noted that President Kibaki was one of the greatest economic brains produced by Africa. And this is not a wonder, because President Kibaki was also the first African to attain a first-class honors degree from the prestigious London School of Economics and Political Science. But how did his leadership abilities, celebrated by the world, translate at home? How do we measure Kibaki the leader during his 50 years of service to our country? At a very early age, the Honorable Mwai Kibaki knew that the biggest challenge of a leader is leading yourself. And to lead yourself, you have to be measured. You have to be disciplined and unwavering. He understood that a leader who does not lead himself will be driven by his difficulties rather than his vision. He will give in to pressure of crowds rather than the chosen path appointed for him. Such a leader will be pushed to make popular choices that please crowds, as opposed to boiled choices that are good for country, but may be unpopular at the moment. This ability to lead himself against the noise and buzz is what brought Muzeki Kibaki this far. His ability to lean in and deal with his most darkest and difficult moments, not in public, but in seclusion, is what distinguishes him as a great leader. And if the true measure of a man is determined by how he stands in a moment of challenge and difficulties, President Kibaki handled his political misfortunes with unparalleled grace. In every low moment, he acknowledged the impending danger, but chose to focus on the attendant opportunities. And two examples will support my observation here. The first happened in 1988, after the infamous Mulolongo election. During this election, the Honorable Mwai Kibaki had served as Vice President and Minister of Finance for 10 years under President Moy. When the new government was formed after the election, the Honorable Mwai Kibaki was demoted from his position as Vice President and made the Minister for Health. At that time, 
popular voices countrywide wanted him to reject what they saw as a humiliation and resign from government altogether. But he shunned the voices of the crowds and opted for the lonely and unpopular path then. To the shock of the nation, he embraced his demotion with grace and continued to serve the country in a lesser capacity. But his superior reasoning was that leadership is not a position, it is a service. And he was ready to serve the country in any position the people summoned him to. With this reasoning, the demands for his resignation were put to rest. The second emotion of his leadership came at the darkest hour in our history as a nation. This was the post-election violence of the year 2007. President Kibaki admitted to all of us that this was one of the lowest moments in his career as a political leader. But turning inwards, he converted this political misfortune into a constitutional moment. You cannot talk about the 2007 crisis without going back to the 2005 constitutional referendum. During this referendum, President Kibaki and his team that were called Banana Team suffered a resounding defeat in the hands of the Orange Team. But he banked the referendum loss as a dream deferred. And he knew that one day, someday, we will fulfill Kenya's clamor for a new constitutional dispensation. Then the 2007 crisis presented itself. At first, it was devastating. But with time, it gave him the opportunity to engage in a constitutional reset executed through bold and uncharted waters. First, and against the wishes of many, he ceded half of his government to his rival then, and he invited Prime Minister Raila Odinga to co-create government with him. Second, he needed to build consensus around his decision, and he did this because he understood that leaders do not look for consensus, rather they build consensus, as once again Martin Luther King Jr. told us. In March of 2008, he led the enactment of minimal constitutional changes to our independence constitution, which established the position of prime minister and two deputies of which I am proud to have served as one. With the 2008 consensus in place and an inclusive government formed, the crisis of 2007 was resolved and spirited away. And in June of that year, our Vision 2030 was launched, setting the stage for better planning and the highest economic growth ever recorded in Kenya. The other notable achievement, which is also the third reset to our constitutional order, was a 2010 referendum. This referendum was meant to retire our independence constitution and allow, align our supreme law to the aspirations of a new republic. And in August of 2010, the deferred dream in 2005 became a reality. And apart from Vision 2030, the challenges of 2007 had gifted our country a new supreme law, the Kenya Constitution 2010. If the true measure of a man, therefore, is how he stands 
in times of challenge and difficulties, from the 2007 dark moment of our nation, President Kibaki stood tall and turned misfortune into positive change. These examples affirm that dreams deferred can never wilt away.